what hello money miners gold's going off its head <laughs> frankie what's going on what what are we talking about today you do a right on money miners why don't money miners <laughs> what's going on today uh we've got some word on the decline money miners <laughs> Gold's going up his head. <laughs> oh, righto, get out of here, you mongrels. Righto, bring, up, bring in the main guys. <laughs> here we go. Mate, I, uh, I think we could be out of a job. <laughs> oh, the future. The future. <laughs> <laughs> right, as, clo- as they said, gold's going off its head. Isn't that the bloody truth? Talk about. Mate, West Gold and Romelius, two very uh, opposite ends of the spectrum in a pre-quarterly update. We're going to go into that, compare the pair. Mate, Regis out of a trading halt. The director's special may have just ripped out one of the best darts of all time regarding <laughs> the Corora chats. Mm. Yet to be determined. And another little bit of m a with regards to Winsum as well. Mm. We're also going to have a little chat about Boss Energy. Maybe uh, it's not all that meets the eye with their announcement today. And going to talk about Develop and ERA, Energy Resources Australia, the company that's predominantly owned by Rio Tinto. Uh, now, the, Maddie, before the uninvestable. And another quick announcement too, Maddie. Just, um, just wanted to plug it again. Now, Thursday, which is tomorrow. Tomorrow, I have to count my days in the the public holiday. Sorry, off Thursday, which is tomorrow at five pm. We're going to be at Brewdog in West Perth for our one year birthday party. Three of us will be there. We're going to drink some beers. Come along if you listen to this podcast. We're not going to advertise it very wide, but just just come along and have a beer with come us. Come have a beer. You well might said. have to pay for it. <laughs> right, hey, what do we got? Let's get into it. Yeah, and, <laughs> and um, I, I, I'm just feeling very inspired by your two daughters, Chloe and Frankie. Their gold's going off its head. Now, <laughs> on days like this when gold's going off its head, I, I like to reflect a bit. I mean, do you check the gold price every day, Matty? Uh, well, I don't have to lately just because of LinkedIn. Yeah. Do you, do, you check the gold, <laughs> do you check the gold price every day, JD? I check commodity prices, you know, pretty regularly. Yeah. Why, why is that? Why do you ask? So do you look at the gold price every day? Like, is that... Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah everybody looks at the gold price every day. Yeah. It's always nice to see it. It's a good start to the morning when you yeah. see it and, and it's gone up, but... Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Dar- Darren Stralos. Oh. <laughs> Darren, Darren also checks the gold price every day. Anyway, mate, I'll... Um, no, I'll, I'll, I'll I don't mind that because at least he's... Producing gold. Yeah. <laughs> so it actually matters. Exactly. Uh, he runs a gold mining company, so oh, fair enough. Thanks, Stretch. Right, let's get a rip right in. Compare the pair. West Gold and Romelius both come out with uh, pre-quarterlies today. One was uh, sort of missed the mark and the other, holy shit, I reckon that is one of the best quarterlies for a company of this scale in terms of cash build that well, I've seen since the friggin' show started, unless a, unless it was a coal mining company. But far out. Let's go into it. So I opened the announcements this morning, guys, and it was great. The first thing I thought is the thumbnail has just done itself already. You got one of them up 15-odd percent, the other one down similarly. That sort of changed over the day. Now Romelius up about 7% last time I looked and West Gold down 16%. But yeah. let's start with West Gold and try and answer the question, the obvious question, why is the market not liking it? And – It's pretty obvious that this is only a pre-quarterly. It's one of those couple page announcements. And often with these ones, you find that the companies try and highlight the good and hide the bad news, but that's not actually the the case there. They've come out, they've said on the back of the weather impacts that they had earlier, that they can no longer actually maintain guidance and they've downgraded guidance. So by the numbers, they produced 52,000 ounces and they sold that at an average price of 3,140 pretty well publicised by the company itself that they are unhedged. So they're making the most of it on that front. But that number, 52,000 ounces, is substantially below the the guided target of roughly 63,000 ounces per quarter to meet the midpoint of their FY24 guidance. So on the back of that, the new guidance figures have come out. 225,000 ounces for the year at a midpoint of 2,200 Aussie all-in sustaining costs. So the ounces have dropped by over 10%. And as we always talk about on the show, when the production ounces or the tons or whatever come off, the costs go up and they can often, you know, swing up quite high. So the costs have jumped up 16%. Yeah, because so, the, the effort, the mill's still turning the same amount, the bloody, there's still the same amount of machines mm-hmm. underground. Uh, it's just yep, yep. bloody a lifting grade or bloody things going through the mill. Bloody, that's what gives you more ounces and less costs because exactly. a lot of it is fixed and they're going to be there the whole time. Yeah, that's why, as we always say, the economies of scale really matter and you've got 
less units to spread those total costs out over. So cash slash bullion build of 9 million for the quarter is pretty weak when you look back at the past few quarters. The past three quarters had an average cash build of about $24 million. $9 million for the quarter for a $1.3 billion company coming into today's announcement. You know, that you don't have to be a a top analyst to think that that's, you know, a bit light on. So, But I suppose you you do hand it to them in the way that even though they've had a shit quarter, there still is a cash build. Um, so they've it's yeah certainly could got be it worse. got it to the point where like buddy at least uh, at least they're still performing with that so oh. it's still there's a bit of positive in it. I'd, I'd also I'd also point out like they've had the, the strategy they've pre they've, they've guided to the market what their quarterly the two most important numbers in their quarterly are going to be for a long time now which is yeah. you know what we was your production and what was the change in cash and they Build. they I mean even on a, a weak quarter like a, a pretty weak quarter they've done that um, they've kept that same strategy which is. You know, encouraging. Mm, yeah. And I suppose, I suppose the hardest thing with these, the pre-quarterlies, we start reading into a lot of stuff, but like there's there's not heaps of information available yet. Like these, the rainfall outages, I think they attributed 5,000 ounces to the rainfall, but we don't know what that's affected, if it was supply chain to the site, if there was f- flooding underground. Um, they did, The big thing in there was talking about was Great Fingal, saying that they're pushing back the, the mining of the upper part, which is not the the cream that they're going for, that's going to – an early start that's getting pushed from Q4 this year to Q1 in FY25. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so – and but then I think we, we talked about in the previous episode, we were predicting they were going to get down to the, the Great Finkel Deeps, which is the main chunk they're chasing, going to get there at sort of Q, Q2 FY25. So – Did you get that – that number right in the uh, in the show. Now nah, that's what I meant. I was talking about the deeps, <laughs> not the not yeah. the like, mate. There's always a way to bloody get yourself out of the shit. <laughs> but predicting, but we don't we don't know if the the rainfall would have affected development at Great Fingal or not. Um, yeah. I haven't haven't got a comment. I actually asked for a comment on it, but I didn't get one. Yeah. But the fact that that's going in that's going in from the side of a pit and the access to the like the Great Fingal decline is further. It's a turnout it's not from the bottom of the mine so you'd, you'd think you'd be able to divert water away from it so I'm not sure if development was impacted there and if that start of Great Fingal has been pushed out a bit um, but they there was they were talking about data they didn't want to go in early without data into the shallow so it's whether that means that they need to drill it out they don't know or it's They've got there and it's not as good as they thought. We don't we don't know yet. So looking yeah. forward to some more context in the quarterly coming up about yeah, what definitely. the flow-on effect will be. Definitely, Matty. So on the flip side of West God, we've got Remelius and they had a they had a great number. You've you've got some of the numbers here, Matty. Yeah. So we'll, and remember they previously upgraded their guidance in uh, after the December quarter, upgraded it to 140 to 155 thousand ounces for the second half. So yeah, two what's that? Two seventy two and a half for the midpoint for FY twenty four. Um, this quarter, eighty nearly eighty seven thousand ounces, uh, even after the upgraded guidance. So they've absolutely smashed that. Um, what they're aiming for this half. So 46,000 out of Mount Magnet, 41,000 ounces out of Edna May. Because if you look at if you look at what they did last quarter, they had 35,000 ounces out of Mount Magnet and 33 out of Edna May. So massive uptick in both plants. Edna, Edna May really outperformed uh, the analyst expectations. I think the Argonaut note said it was about 27% above what they were pitching and then Mount Magnet above as well. So, yeah. I, I saw the giant cash build and my initial reaction is all well, like they're Must really re- penny. reaping the rewards of this like 30 gram per tonne, like penny sugar hit that they're mm. getting, but runs out fast and we know it runs out fast, but you're telling me that Edna May is a big contributor yeah. here. So what, what happened at Edna May to kind of contribute there? Oh, they, it's pre-quarterly, don't know, don't know yet. yet. Yeah. Wow. So it's just, they just said that's like, you look at the ounce build on it, um, Probably had to go through the last quarters to see what was planned, but um, mm. you know they've absolutely smashed their guidance in bloody one quarter. So, but yeah, the the cash bill. So they're just over tick over four hundred million dollars in cash and bullion now. So there are uh, yeah. As as I said, the oh, have you seen? Can you remember a gold miner or something of this scale printing a hundred, adding one hundred twenty million in cash in one quarter? This is yeah, it's pretty bloody phenomenal. I, rain I rain obviously didn't affect them. I can't. I, I can't 
I can't remember it. Yeah. Daddy, I mean, like, pretty phenomenal. That's probably more money than Evolution <laughs> makes in a year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but they got a lower all in sustainable oh, cost. Sorry about that. <laughs> So now we've got a, um, a really interesting one. We sort of speculated a bit about Regis. We knew it was McPhillamy sort of related, what was coming out there in trading halt for a little while. Now the numbers have come out now. Let's get into them because I think there's some pretty pretty interesting follow-on effects of the, the updated numbers that we've seen today. No, no announcement of any funding or no. anything yet because no. we thought there might have been a book bill no, going on. that was uh, the wrong intel. I have been told. So just put a line through that. Some of our darts completely miss, Matty. Uh, <laughs> no, they, we, yeah, so, yeah, that's the way to do it. So if it doesn't happen, we say it was bad intel. Yeah. It but was, if it does happen, it was our idea. It wasn't, it wasn't our fault. <laughs> uh, anyway, <laughs> so, so after spending two days in trading help, but Regis, they come out today with some updated numbers for, for McPhillamy's development project um, out over there in New South Wales and Recall McPhillamy's has has long been kind of held up by complicated approvals, permitting process that comes with building a mine in New South Wales. Um, I'll rattle through some of the big numbers to, to wrap your head around here and keep in mind the last time like Regis themselves rinsed real numbers through the market was back in 2017. So that's seven odd years ago. Those numbers are Gornsky's now, right? But um, And we, I guess we, we knew that, but the uh, yeah. question is, are they more Gornsky's than... Super Gornsky's. Well, I, I mean, I think you had you had it in the city note that came out today, Kate McCutcheon basically saying that in the September qu- quarterly call, um, management was still kind of quoting numbers of about 500 to 600 million kind of capex number. It was, it was about appropriate. And what we've got today is way different to that. I basically yeah. double that. Um, and, and that number, which was the, you know, in and around the consensus analyst expectation, probably a bit higher than that number, was already multiples of what that Initial one. Um, yeah. yeah. I think Argonaut had 800 mil. On they it, did say that today, yeah. So, look, look you've got I'll, – I'll flash up the, the revised numbers on screen now. And basically when you you look at the – they were just construction costs and pre-production costs, but I think the difference there is actually just to do with, with stripping um, as opposed to, you know – OPEX that you'd want to throw in the, yeah. in, the, in the mix to a positive cash flow. So the way I interpret this is like you got a you got a funding gap of at least sort of you know one point one billion dollars to to fund this thing, and then maybe some OPEX on top of that in order to get to positive cash flow. But like if you if you just if you just think of it now that 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 is um that is a pretty big you know detail one point one billion. That's a pretty big pretty big uplift versus what was previously in in the market. The the consensus expectations were like you said JD around that sort of six hundred million dollar mark. Um, so I, I, I'm, I mean like $1.1 billion or $1 billion for a one gram per ton ore body in New South Wales. I mean, like when you first look at that, you kind of think, geez, if it wasn't for all the, the years of hard work they put into this already, you'd nearly say it's just too, too hard. And, and so then it just got me, got me digging even more. I was like, Fuck, what is, what's going on here with these numbers? I went all the way back to the 2017 PFS to see where the big discrepancies in capital are. And I'll flash up on screen now what the CapEx estimate was back then like see that total capex 215 million bucks <laughs> holy shit um, there are some big explanations for the blowout you know beyond simply cost inflation in 2017 look at the small costing there for water supply pipeline it's a mere 38 million bucks but in the release today it reveals they had to build 90 kilometers of pipeline to, to, to build back in 2017 they assumed 70 kilometers to build but hadn't yet settled they had two water options back then one was you know a pipeline from Mount Piper and Springvale mine um, a second option was a pipeline groundwater from uh, 80 kilometers away where they actually had these water access licenses over the long term in 20 in also in the 2017 PFS they assumed they'd draw 18 uh, megawatts of power from the grid via a nearby substation now they've got to draw it from an alternative regional power infrastructure, which is 14 kilometers to the north. So I assume they've got to build some infrastructure required to get the power to site from 14 k's away. Um, and there's just a, a bunch of additional capital, they say, in relation to just the water treatment and management on site as well, which um, is, is, is is how they justify the CapEx es- escalation, which is a bit, a bit, um, a fair bit north of what everyone was expecting. And that, that was for those numbers there, Trav, back then. That's That was for 7 million tonnes. 7 million tonnes. Circuit had changed, like the flow sheet had changed slightly. Uh, it was like whole of all processing instead. But, I mean, there's, yeah, like 7 million tonnes, the same the same size meal. Yeah, right. Mate, water, can't water and power buggy up? Yeah. Jesus Christ. Water and power, you're 100% right. Oh, mate, do you want power, Trav? 
we I, got power here. I do not take Just a flick of a switch, mate. we got a new partner. Talking power. What a perfect segue to Silverstone. <laughs> you bloody ripper. Talk about a company up with the times, mate. Regis, get on the blower right now. Renewable solar farms, bloody EV charging stations. Check out these friggin' photos. Mate, the, look at EV Hiluxes, EV Polaris buggies to plug into these charging stations. Hybrid power stations, mate, battery energy storage solutions, green tech, green tech, green tech, mate, old school remote power stations for camps, underground power, processing plants, mate, check the freaking clients they've worked with. So this got, is, this is like these, mobile mate. power solutions, but... Mate, just everything. Like, mate, dude... You, you want to get an underground going, you get these guys. You want to bloody put a solar farm in. You want to charge bloody Polaris buggies, mate. They look at Just look at the rap sheet here. Min Res, Fortescue, Roy Hill, Pilbara Minerals, BHP. Look at this wow. BHP EV charging station, mate. Umber, this, mate, you want to talk about the GC filtering process, the assessment required to get on money of mine. Kenny Keo, <laughs> high distinction. Mate, this... High distinction, mate. This bloke knows power. Mate, Certified GC, hey? mate. He he he's he had a previously had a big power business, sold it, back at it again, mate. This is it's not the one only thing they do. Power Silverstone, one stop mine and shop. Flick Kenny at sstone.com.au and email. He's your man for power, mate. So excited to have him on board. I don't own an EV yet, Maddie, but when I when I do buy one, I'm going to get one of these charging stations. You get it. Do you want a big BHP sign on top of it as well, I want, Trey? I want a money of mine. Sorry. Anyway, but this is the beauty. These ads aren't planned. They just pop in when we see fit. Mate, <laughs> right. Back to Regis. The implications of this funding, Trav, because holy snap and duck shit, a million dollars. A billion bucks is a lot of coin to come up with for a one gram ore body in New South Wales that is uh, going through issues getting the yeah. This I think there's some. Tick. I honestly do think there's some pretty big implications here, and and they all relate to funding because it, it it I see it complicating things a fair bit for them in in some ways in relation to this project, right? Like in addition to those capital escalations, costs are pretty north of um of, of estimates beforehand. They say sixteen hundred to well. 18, 1800 bucks an ounce all in sustaining costs now. And like another thing to consider is that unfortunately McPhillamese doesn't give you rapid payback because of a, a, a high grade zone near surface that you get to first, which allows faster payback. Like I, I plucked this chart here um, from the PFS back in 2017, obviously, but you see year one there, that's oh, the- look at the grade. Yeah, yeah. that's the lowest grade and the lowest production. So you get the high grade and a higher production ounce is back-ended, which is not not the best for payback periods as when it comes to financing the mine, obviously. Neither is a massive CapEx bill. Neither is a massive CapEx bill, you're right. They really work against each yeah. other, yeah. don't they? Yeah. Yeah. You want to flip that shit yeah. over. So yeah. I, I, did, I did an extremely rough back-of-the-envelope NPV calc um, based on the numbers to wash through the market today, and they don't look very good at all to, to, to me. So, look, I was extremely rough in my my model here. My, my assumptions are on display on the screen. So feel free to, to scrutinize the assumptions. I mean, some of these assumptions are pretty punitive, but like I, I get negative $500 million NPV. Um, and does, does the 1 billion to a negative 500 million capex normally pass the, <laughs> pass the, the build test? The, the, the reason I get a negative NPV is because like I, I they, they, they guide what, 1600 to $1,800 on sustaining cost. I say, okay, assume it's seventeen fifty for example. And then I do the Johnny Mac, you know, rule of thumb times that by 1.5 and that's your real, your real corporate all-in cost. I run that life of mine at a $3,000 per ounce gold price. It's kind of, I feel like I'm being generous because it's above consensus, but it's obviously below spot. Discount rate 8%, um, you know, and then I'm just, like like saying that the first two years is no production because they're just building the thing five hundred million dollars each year and then you, you you discount that back and it's um like that's a negative NPV. Mm. Uh, well, and look, three thousand bucks, even though that's well below spot, it's probably for a realised price considering they're probably going to have to take on a, a lot of debt to do this. So once the hedging impact comes in, that probably might be a bit lower. Yeah, uh, and I mean, I could, a billion dollars capex for a negative NPV, like for for an asset. That's one gram per ton in, in New South Wales. Uh, you know, I, the, the 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 real question I actually think, Maddie, is like, do they even fund this at all now? I almost mm. kind of, and, and there's still some delays to be held up because as a result of some changes in the, the plan and permitting, they've got to put in this amendment and that can be time consuming. I almost kind of think they'll just kick the can down the road longer, maybe in 
you know, 12, 18 months, they might, um, yeah. the gold price might be just to the moon and then everything just gets financed and you can, you can hedge at a high price and all that sort of stuff. But I just, I honestly, like, I don't see how, how you go ahead. I actually don't think their shareholders would want them to, to go ahead and, and pursue it either. I think like, what do you do? Do you, do you, do you sell it? Do you, you know, do you do a, run a process to, to partner with someone on it? But like, who, who wants to, who wants to, be a, an investor alongside that if that's the kind of returns. It, it's not. Re, it's not really passing the like the Newmont filter, is it? Like I know they're in the you got Cadia in the New South Wales region, but it's like I don't think it's the it fits that blue chip scale. It's just low grade, right? Yeah. Um, and when you have yeah much higher costs, low grade, it, it's not forgiving at all. Like you took yeah high grade can be forgiving if you have escalating costs, but low grade is not definitely not forgiving. Mm. Yeah, um, I think it very much goes in the in the shelf for now and we don't sort of hear about it whilst they try and iterate things and, you know, look at options, but it's, it's just not going to get developed it. I, I think pretty surprisingly, like the share price didn't actually move too much after being in Holt for two days. I think you could interpret that as, okay, other gold is ripped over the last couple of days. Mm. They've just foregone that potential rip. It's, it's down a couple of percent, but, you know, nothing too substantial. But I do think it's a pretty big blow to Regis. Um, on the plus side, you know, they might actually have – if, if, if there's a general consensus out there in the market that this actually isn't worth pursuing, um, then it just frees up their capital to do something else maybe that is a fair bit more attractive. And like if I were a shareholder, I'd probably be advocating that. Like contingent on what numbers do ultimately get, get you know, come to the market in the in June when their DFS is a, is supposed to come out to market. And I know my, my numbers are probably pretty pretty harsh just the way I treat um, the, the costs there. But... You know, I'm not very excited at all about this project being developed by Regis. Yeah, and everyone has always talked about it for ages. Oh, no, it's the, the growth project. It's a ripping project. But you, just that one gram always stood out. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And then yeah. You, you had the challenges, obviously, permitting it and, and whatnot. Just to, to put it in a, a bit of perspective as well, looking through a few of the sell-side reports, they had it equating to 15-ish percent of the MPV of, of the business. So, you know, it, it wasn't the – the, the main um, value driver of, of the company, but it was definitely the, the growth story. So yeah. that's what's really taken a hit. Yeah. A few other considerations in relation to this number and implications it could have for further companies, thanks to Twitter. First one, uh, Mondi, who immediately poses the question on what this CapEx number could mean for DeGray's Hemi. And I think it's a, w- a worthy question Oh, God, yeah, especially ask. with an 800,000 tonne box train in there <laughs> yeah 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 i mean i think what was their number their recent capex estimate was like 1.5 billion or something along those lines yeah. in this case i think a lot of the, the the blowout is in relation to you know infrastructure and capex they didn't think they had to spend but now they do i don't know if that's going to be the same for you know for hemi or not but they're, they're building the you know pox train and, and everything it's in it's in like iron ore country where um there's competition like you competition for the mining services providers to service you versus iron ore, which can pay through the roof, etc. And then number two comes from Respeculator, who points out what the implications could be for EMR Capital, um, who their majority owner of Ravenswood Gold Mine in Queensland, and and he basically says, um, uh, you know, EMR, uh, they, they, you know, that like the the sell for EMR to sell their Ravenswood Gold Mine now is is pretty pretty simple one, right? Spend a billion dollars um, in pre-production capex for for Regis on McFilmies, or do you just you know, buy a 200, 250,000 ounce per annum uh, gold miner in Ravenswood and, and get on day one cash flow with a price tag of call it 1.5 billion, which um, yeah. I, he's just pulled that number out of his ass, I'm sure. But, you know, you could you could probably um, build the case that the that the uh, the uh whoever's selling that asset will make um, nonetheless. I think it's interesting, right? Yeah, that one's been in the in the headlines a bit lately in, in good old data room sale process. So. Uh, yeah, I reckon they would be doing the, the concurrent sale process in IPO on that one, which was the, like you run the dual, tra- dual transaction structure and just try to maximise value. That's what they did with 29 metals. Make the bankers work for it, mate. <laughs> <laughs> when, when's that section 10 due to come through? They signal, Hopefully favourably. They signal a couple of months. There could be an outcome on that. But, you know, they also talk about needing to, to, to resubmit or like put an amendment to an, ap- an existing application in some other area. I don't quite understand all the approvals processes, but that would – require um there's an amendment required because the layout's going to be different as per all these other dfs numbers but my gut feel is that 
a lot of the the holdups are almost going to be convenient for Regis now. In the past, they were a hindrance, but now because the numbers look like they might be shit, like the <laughs> the delays could be convenient because it just allows them to, you know, build build their cash in in the interim and and, and perhaps allocate that cash to a better opportunity before they actually, you know, even even have to tell the market that they're able to fund this thing. <laughs> yeah, God, it'd be, it's interesting. You'd, th- you'd think New South Wales government, if they looked at this, they'd lick their lips. Like, you'd think to bring a, mi- a billion dollars worth of capex into the economy uh, in a, a state that's not as prolific in mining as uh, Western Australia. But yeah, yeah I don't know. I'm sure they've asked for some. <laughs> a good bit of it leaves the country straight away as well for the equipment and all these sorts of things. Yeah, I guess I guess so. Yeah, for fucking so just more for the fact it's a, a lot of it's residential over there. So yeah. anyway, uh, mate, rampant speculation on the director's special. Jeez, it's bloody flying in. Oh, it's like it's like the word on the decline's getting better now that we're uh, <laughs> attached to a newsletter. Well, none of it's none of it's <laughs> confirmed yet, but um. Mate, we're uh, it's close. I we're, reckon it's bloody close. We're yeah. now in the business of spreading rumours. Uh, maybe we've always been in that business. I've sure. always been. You two are now <laughs> up the end. We've joined well. you the in the business of spreading rumours. Uh, Welcome. If you aren't subscribed to our daily newsletter, the director special, then what on earth are you doing with yourself? Because we have spread two new rumours today. Uh, which, until proven otherwise, I'm going to assume that both rumours are 100 percent true. <laughs> That's the the natural stance for rumours. Rumour number one: the win- Winsome deal. So obviously, Winsome in trading halt yesterday. Our rumour that we put forward in the director special is it relates to the Renard Diamond Mine, which is um, on care and maintenance some 60-odd kilometres from Winsome's Adena project. Now, Winsome, they need a, a road to be built from Renard to Adena to kind of unlock Adena's logistics route um, in the first place. But but there's some latent infrastructure that might be handy at the at the permitted site. Um, but we'll wait and see how the how that unfolds and if that rumour is true. That one's really interesting because there was an article about the, diamond, the three diamond mines currently owned by Rio Burgundy and De Beers in the north of Canada, yeah. and they spoke about a, a loose figure of three million bucks to build one kilometre of road. So Yeah. Yeah, right. I, I, do, th- I do think that... That's, that's only usable for less than two months of the year. Yeah. 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 We, I mean, Winsome's logistics are, con- are kind of constrained until they get a, get, get a road developed, and um, but hopefully, hopefully if this deal goes through, then it can potentially tighten that, that time to production, but we'll wait and see. It is, it is a permitted operation as well, right, which might help in, in some respects. I don't quite understand all the, the Canadian permitting implications. Rumour number two, Maddie, this is an interesting oh, one. word on the decline. Carora is- Suda. So, like, after putting every ASX gold company on yesterday's thumbnail, we're now going to point the, the finger overseas instead. Uh, Agnico Eagle is uh, what we wrote in the in the mm. director's special. Interesting because they're so big. They're massive. They're three times as big as Northern Star, $30 billion US company. Giant gold company Huge. listed on the NYSE. They own I think you did mention them last week. I think you dropped a name as a possible sweeter outside of Australia. Give yourself oh, some yeah. credit, Trav. Yeah. Did I say that? Oh, yeah. I'll, I'll no, say 100%, that. I'll it. 100% every <laughs> take time. Take it. Take it. Um, they, don't, they don't own a mine in WA yet, mm. but – could they be the Carora Suda, mate? Mm. So they were. They've obviously got Fosterville after they merged with, uh, took over Kirkland, Kirkland. Lake. Yep. Um, but yeah, they're so probably seeing them try to trying to get their targeting Carora. A lot what hundred and twenty thousand ounces doesn't really uh, move the needle too much for Agnico. But you you must think if they're trying to get a get their foot into WA, it must be set part of some bigger plans of getting some more gold over here. Just, it just like yeah yeah when yeah. you're a thirty billion US thirty billion dollar company, um, it's really interesting. Yeah, if and, true, if if true, <laughs> these but, darts might be um, more on the money than some of our our previous ones though, Jensen. Well, and it's probably like probably more appealing for Carora because you know our our theories were around <coughs> merging with an ISX company and getting a getting a listed on the ISX possibly dual listing bit of a re-rate on the back of it uh, from a merger ratio, but this would just be a takeover with a premium slap to them straight away. So You think it'd be cash? Yeah. Oh, yeah, you'd, it'd have to be cash. Oh, it, it doesn't have to be. No. But nah, it could be. Could be a script. But you can offer – the script would be at a premium. Yeah, and um, for, for Canadians getting US stock, maybe they view that slightly mm, different to getting ASX. Which would mean it's likely bypassing the ASX completely and it'll just be staying in – and then you go Eagle on the TSX and that's it. NYSE. Yep. NYSE, sorry. Yeah. TSX as well, eh? Mm. Yeah, TSX and NYSE. 
Here's to much more speculation, gentlemen. Mm. So up to the director special if you want to, yeah, read out rampant speculation because we're not always going to reveal it on the show, Matty. We, nah. we might leave some just for the newsletter. It <laughs> might have been falsified by the time we get to the show. I was going to say, <laughs> I thought you were about to say we're not always wrong either. <laughs> So, some people just predict three dollars fifty two oh, as mate, a takeover price. Mate. That, this is the problem. We are the marketing team, so we can fluff ourselves up as much <laughs> as we want. Bloody yeah! So we're not no bosses, right? Speaking of bosses, Boss Energy. What, what oh, a segue! Yeah, geez, didn't that work well? First uranium getting close, JD. It is. So they've completed their final technical milestones at the the restart project at the honeymoon. So the lexiviant, the the leaching fluid has been injected. It sort of sits there for a little while, soaks up the uranium and then gets pumped back out the ground, runs through the processing plant. That is in the works. That's all into the the plant now. So it's not all good news. I had a look back at one of their latest announcements from the very end of February, and that was headlined, Key Production Tests Paveway for First Drum of Uranium This Quarter. So we'll flash it up on YouTube now. But essentially they said that they would, by the end of March, have produced their first drums of uranium, which they have not yet done. And it looks like that's going to happen in the back half of April. So a little slip, a a few weeks, up to a month, nothing too, you know, bad. But given that the the company, perhaps as you might expect, didn't make any mention of this delay, it does make me wonder, and if I were a shareholder, I would be thinking, what's the holdup? Is there anything to be concerned about? What is it? You know, this is not a process that's done widely across Australia, although it's pretty common practice over in Kazakhstan and at other uranium operations, but just want to know what the what the sort of holdup is and maybe ask the question to management. Yeah, right. Mate, speaking of, you know, it might become more common, this bloody in situ leaching. You know yeah. who I've met recently? Did you meet Ooh. James? I chance? met James who drilled out the paleo channel for Paladin at Emu Creek back in the day, a few years ago, Emu Creek. and smashed it. Where, really? Where's that? In WA, Trav, that was bloody before the mining, uranium mining was no good in WA. <laughs> and it was convenient meeting this guy because, tell you what, he's on board as well. <laughs> WA water bores, big James. Mate, you want to find water, you want to drill through the absolute puss and shit of the world, and especially in the gold fields to find water. And, mate, if you even want to drill for uranium in a paleo channel, mate, these guys, WA water bores, are the experts in this field, mate. They've they've created a bit of a niche in the Goldfields Paleo Channel. So they, bloody, because she's clay pus there. People have gone there. People have failed. Not till now, till James and WA Waterballs went there. Mate, they've got a customised air core rig that pretty much punches holes, finds the deepest part of these paleo channels, which are bloody, it's the old structure. That's where the water is, mate. That's where, mate, the gold fields needs water. Mate, there's bloody, I don't know about in the gold fields. There's probably uranium there as well. But they find the (laughs) deepest part. Then they've bloody got the mud, the mud rotary equipment to drill the bores, set the bores up, mate, anything to, I'll I'll show you this bloody video here. This is them after they've intersected the water and air flushing it out. Look at the water pissing out. Mate, this is, mate. Look at those rigs. They're beautiful. Mate, aren't they sensational? Mate, this is a big claim, but I reckon WA water bores will find you water 100% of the time every time. Yeah. And, And clean water? Clean, yeah. mate, well, Stay line I was, free. I was talking to him. <laughs> if, actually, if you want clean water, he'll find you clean they, water. They put the bloody, they put the this bloody gravel shit around the casing, and that actually filters the water when before they actually pump it out of yeah. the boards, mate. Anything to do with water, mate. They can even do breakthrough holes for services for paste or to underground mines, mate. Anything setting up bore fields, mate. You name it, and. As I said, mud rotary drilling for uranium exploration. Mate, John A. Fisher at Cauldron Energy, you will be listening. James at wawaterbores.com.au is the bloody email you need to send out the Savi. We know you're drilling bloody paleo channels at Yanry. James needs to be doing it for you. He'll smash it out just like he did for Paladin back in the day. Mate, good to have you on board, WA Waterbores. Jeez. And, mate, tell you what, equal marks with Kenny Keo. On mm. the GC assessment. This bloke is an absolute GC. They haven't got a website, just get in the show notes. They don't need it, mate. They yep. don't they drill they drill for water. They yep. don't need a marketing team. They're not distracted. It's right here. 
Yeah. It's right here. Hey, Jeff, you've got to get your breath back after that track. Does it? Do you feel do you what you feel like you want some water now? I feel like I want a, a water bore in here to just access clean water all the time. I, I hate walking to the water fountain. I just love a bloody Oh mate, James, the, mate. The nothing is out of reach for James, oh, I'll I mean, tell you. <laughs> tell you that, mate. Right, let's mate, develop. New Woodlawn restart figures released. Uh there's been plenty of plenty of them. They keep getting better every time. <laughs> Yeah, so you're dead right. The updated mine plan came out about six months ago, Maddie, pretty soon for, for another one, but they did have new numbers come out not too long ago, so we're given the, the benefit of the doubt. Let's run through the, the numbers that matter. So the restart capital cost jumped from 32 to 42 bucks. MPV from 480 million to 660 million. So getting into why that happened, what are the numbers that they've tweaked? Obviously, like I said, the, um, the amount of tonnes that they've got Jumped up, the mine life went from seven years to 10 years. The average realised prices, this is what really matters, jumped up for every single commodity. So copper, zinc, lead, silver, and gold. The exchange rate, Aussie dollar to US dollar, marginally weakened, which increases your, your Aussie dollar cash flow. There was an interesting headline. So in the first page, they've got copper price, US 8,770 bucks, roughly for the first 18 months. And then, you know, you might be deceived into thinking, hey, that's what they've sort of flushed through the model, but that's not right. When you go into the detail and see the, the life of mine average copper price, it's almost 9,800 US dollars. So not not insane, nothing like double the price like we've seen at times, but a good bit above spot, so something to to bear in mind. And the um, the payable amounts of metal for, for copper jumps from 60,000 tonnes to 80,000 tonnes. Zinc is also up. So this is all working off there updated reserves of 6 million tonnes at 1.5% copper, 1.3% lead and 3.6% zinc. So that all brings us to uh, a point which I think is one of the more interesting points on page five, next steps. Now they say they are exploring funding options, including potentially selling a minority interest. So Mm. potential candidates, you got strategic investors, traditional project finance or offtake financing. I mean, that doesn't really narrow it down at all. Oh, that's what that's what Cav mentioned in our chat. Could be like a downstream partner in yeah. Korea or bloody Japan or or something like that. Not necessarily a operating partner over here. Yeah, um, they are the operator. Yeah, I, w- I would given given their sort of expertise and whatnot. I'd definitely lean away from thinking it's an operating partner. Mm. Potentials maybe Toho Zinc. They're a Japanese zinc smelter and refining firm. They have a JV, the Abra JV with Galena here in. WA already, so they're in Australia. Then you've got other trading houses. We know Bill was recently in Switzerland, the the home of all commodity traders. So, yep. you know, Glencore, they've got uh, a strong presence in Australia, obviously. You've also got Traffy, who could potentially come in with some sort of financing. Um, what about POSCO? Yeah, the, the Korean, yeah. I mean, steelmaking firm, but they've, you know, branched out into other other types of metals and whatnot. So they, they, I'm sure, would be in the mix as well. Yeah. The other question is why are they looking at doing this? So like I said, $42 million is the restart cost. That's not that assuming for a, um, for a company that's capped at almost $600 million. But to put it in a bit more perspective, you've got a max drawdown of $67 million and for, for good measure to be a bit conservative, I'd call it above $80 million is the type of financing that they'd want. They've had this stance of not wanting to do any dilution. Now, they've already sort of broken that when they did a capital raising around the time of the Pioneer Dome acquisition. But there is perhaps a way in which they, you know, perhaps this is the way in which they achieve financing by not diluting, by not raising any more capital. They smell, a, they sell a small stake, don't have to, you know, go to the brokers and perhaps uh, diminish the, the sort of polish around the brand at all. And then you also don't have to worry about going and getting bank financing from your, you know, your, your big four Aussie banks or anything like that. And perhaps that's a bit more challenging when, you know, they're not going to take the numbers from develop. They're going to run their own yeah. numbers through it. So, yeah, I think that's the uh, the core reasoning why they're talking about this recycling of capital, as um, as they said in the announcement mm. today. A lot of um, a big company sort of talk there. Yeah, but, and it's like that, you know, 42 mil, it was – essentially a brand new plan. There's obviously modifications to be done to it, but it's going to once it's going to be a pretty good walk up start because it's all 
developed, ready to go. Uh, they're straight into the ore and developed well, well ahead of time. Do you do you think though in this, it's a bit of a play at the moment with the the lack of potential copper investment of this scale in Australia. It's like they could probably get good bang for buck for that minority interest. Um, Is there, would, do you think it would be pretty appealing for these potential partners? P- potentially appealing. I think like a, a bigger consideration is just like what JD talked about is like funding it. Like imagine if you had to do a, a, a partial equity raise to, to yeah. fund it, then if you did that um, – it's just you don't you never want to be raising equity at a lower price than your last equity raise. And keep in mind, when they last did their equity raise, their share price was was a fair bit higher than it is right now. But do you think so also selling the selling the stake is because he would want a shitload more money in the company to pursue other opportunities. So do you think selling a minority stake takes the takes the handcuffs off a bit and allows develop to potentially grow? Yeah, I mean a they've got easier. they've got four as of. Jan thirty one, I think they said they had forty odd in cash and thirty in in a- asset finance debt. So it's not a you know astoundingly strong um, balance sheet position to be in. Perhaps they do want to buffer that up, and you know it's a it's a company that's um, interested in doing deals. The way so. the way to think about it too is like what what IRR do they put on on these numbers? And I get that these. Are- Numbers are a bit, you know, skew with, but they, it was like a three hundred percent IRR or something, right? Oh yeah, so, but that's a, so they keep updating that number yeah, the more they do yeah. to the project. But like someone that someone that buys into the project, you know, chuck in them whatever their, their acquisition price, they get the benefit of that super high IRR. Like you're not gonna if that IRR number is real, you're not gonna sell down a percentage stake in your business and allocate that anywhere more efficiently. You can't get three hundred percent IRR in any other way. Like that's just mental. You do the yep. sell like if that number is real, which I'm not saying it is, but but what you do is it's, it just it just makes the funding better. It validates the project because you bring someone yeah. else in. Maybe if you have a trader who part owns the project, then whatever off-take arrangement is in, in place, like you're less hamstrung by it because they actually own, own the equity of the project at the same time. It could be those sort of like other dynamics that, that make it a, a, on the whole a bit more palatable. And to your point too, like I do think there's a flexibility part when you have more like capital free, you can pursue other opportunities that yeah. in the long run might make sense, but I don't think you can reallocate something at a higher IRR than than, than that yeah. if the yeah. number is real. Yeah, well, there you go. Wait and see. Jeez, uh, there's so much pending news everywhere, isn't there? Exciting. We're waiting to see what happens with develop. We're waiting to see what happens with McPhillamy's. It's pending. We're waiting to see what Romelius is going to do with all this cash. What's going to happen with Spartan? Mate, what a day job. What a day job. Now, speaking of intriguing ASX companies, oh, God, do you even – yeah, company, loose loose term, <laughs> Rio's uranium project. This is the, the most – in- pa- Willie Packer owns a bit of. <laughs> yeah, Rio's rehab project. <laughs> This um this is the most intriguing uranium company on the ASX to me, Maddie. And and I've a confession, right? I'm fascinated with this stock. This is this is the most interesting uranium stock on the ASX to me because I've referred to this stock before as uninvestable. I've I've used th- that word on on air to describe this stock, and I don't use those words lightly. But I'm I'm so intrigued because there's a particular well-known investor in the Perth fund manager world that clearly has a very different view to me and I'm dying to figure out what he sees. The stock I'm talking about is ERA or Energy Resources of Australia. And now ERA owns the Ranger Uranium Rehab Project <laughs> and the undeveloped Jabaluka Uranium Deposit. Now, why do I refer to this stock as uninvestable? It's because ERA has a rehab liability of $2.4 billion dollars. And they aren't producing anything. They got no revenue. They're in rehab mode. And that rehab number doubled in the last 12 months, despite them spending a few hundred million dollars on rehab in the year. So they don't have enough cash to fund that rehab as they currently stand. Only $726 million in cash. Only. (laughs) Who would have thought that wouldn't be enough? (laughs) And their undeveloped project, Jabaluka, has got to be one of the least likely projects to ever become a mine in Australia as a result of you know the immense opposition from from the tr- traditional owners. In yeah, Kak- Kak- Kakadu National mm. Park. Yeah. yeah, it'd be like saying we're just going to put a portal into Ayers Rock. Yeah, the oh. the, the Mira people are you know vehemently opposed to the development of that. Yeah. And um, you know when you think of the dynamics of of um, you know the scrutiny Rio Tinto has been put up. Uh, put, yeah, put under as a result of, you know, Jock and 
gorge, Drooking Gorge, you got to say there's even like there's just there's just no chance, right? This thing does not get built in our lifetimes, no way, shape, or form. So, so like imagine a company where their cash flow model looked like this: cash outflows of nearly three billion dollars over the next decade, operating cash inflow zero. Only way to fund that outflow: dilution to shareholders. You tell me that company is uninvestable, right? And yet this company has a market capitalization of $1.2 billion on the ASX today. And that is mental to me. Granted, because Rio Tinto owns 86.3% of ERA, the daily volume on this stock is not heaps. But look who the second biggest shareholder is, Willie Packer. (laughs) I'd love to know what Willie Packer sees here as a shareholder. It's such an intriguing bet. And there's every chance that the actual rehab requirement here will keep blowing out. Like, look at this from the annual report they just put out. Uh, It says, um, activities post 2027 and estimates of their cost remain highly uncertain. These activities remain subject to a number of studies and are also potentially sensitive to external events, such as estimates of expenditure beyond 2027. (laughs) Um, So the news today is essentially that Rio Tinto is going to manage the rehab of Ranger under a master services agreement with ERA now, so Rio, Rio basically do all the rehab. They pass on the costs in their entirety to ERA. And look, there's a raise on the way here. There used to be some guidance about a capital raising um, in the second half of 2024, but I wouldn't be surprised to see it brought forward either. See this from their annual report again. ERA will engage with Rio Tinto and other shareholders in relation to a material equity raise in 2024. Fucking should be material, all right. What, what, okay. a, what a mystery. This, um, this company is, and a, a, as it relates to, to Jabaluka, the, the lease there expires in August this year. ERA have applied to renew it, but they simultaneously state that they will not develop it. ERA is a signatory to the long-term care and maintenance agreement over Jabaluka. It's a fascinating one. I suppose the only reason this company exists because so it's not part of the Rio Tinto portfolio. <laughs> yeah, I mean... Like, like, essentially... I think Rio Tinto have, have had a fair bit of, you know, like back and forth over the journey, almost trying not to, you know, f- like trying to trying to fund the bare minimum rehab, et cetera. It's like, but, and then they've kind of had to, had to chip in. There's been a bit of a back and forth on that front, but it's so, it's so fascinating to me how it has a, a you know, a billion dollar plus valuation and just like you look at the economics of it and you're like, what is this company? I don't mm. understand it. Do you, do but you, the, 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 in- the incentives are the, the thing I want to talk about here. And at Rio Tinto, the incentives are to just kick the massive rehab cost down the down the road as far as possible. So just keep paying. I mean, they're balancing that with, you know, their social license in, in Australia as well, right? But at the individual level, the CEO and these sorts of people, they don't want to take that massive hit against the, the earnings of the business, you know. So that if they can do it by continually paying... 50, 100, 200 million dollars a year instead of, you know, one, two billion right now, then that is what you'd think the the more likely outcome is until they leave the job and then the next person mm. has to think about it. But there's a lot of different dynamics and there's a long, long history here, which is probably in itself worthy of its its own podcast. The Xavier's listened, paid attention to my bloody random deep dives, which I reckon you might have. Do you remember how this got in the Rio portfolio? Oh, you did tell us, Matty. I was remember they it, they bought North Limited. Was oh, this to do with the yeah. Tanamice story? Yeah, so yeah, North had yeah North Parks, Tanami, this, yeah. and there was some other ones as well. But this was one of them. Wow. Yeah, that's how it was in there. Wow. Yeah. yeah. What, what? Why do you think this has a one point two billion dollar market cap? It's so illiquid. It's not a one point two billion dollar market can you, cap. Can you even like <laughs> attribute attribute a bloody an NPV to it or anything yeah. based on the fact yeah. that it's not? The NPV be... is like you just run a cash flow on that like negative outflows. Yeah, I know, but yeah. but in oh yeah, I mean, but I mean of the project, like considering it's not going to be built in the decade. Well, if you, so you apply <laughs> probability of zero to those like yeah, that's, a, that's what I mean. Like, but it, you're right. Like it's it, like some. I think the investment case is a call option on one day in the never never Jabaluka becoming a, a development. That's the only thing I can think of in my head. But it just also you contend that with the realities of like. Imagine the opposition you'd get, like, and, and imagine fighting that fight. That's a yeah. that'd be a pretty 
you know, isolating fight to fight if you mm. if you wanted to run that fight. So. I think because I think it's I think it's like a hundred million pounds or something of uranium. It's a lot. It's not like a it's not a, not a Atabasca basin. Um, it's it's thing. one of the best assets it's, in the in the world. Yeah, it's yeah. not deep it's like no, nowhere near as deep. So your cost yeah, your cost yeah, basis yeah. Is, is is phenomenal. But, I think. But it's can not, you guys it's not name, like a big high grade? Can you can, can you name me another one point two billion dollar company that would trade eighteen grand worth of stock in one day? Like the, the market cap isn't a proper, like Willy Packer can't sell that stock. Yeah. You know? Yeah. He can, yeah, you're right. There's, <laughs> there's, there's angling for an outcome. Dilution will come in and maybe his overall stake gets, gets reduced and whatnot, but it's not a, a you know, it's as, it's as good as a private company almost that has to do all the, the reporting of a public company. Jeez, you got us thinking. Mm. I'm no good at these questions. I think it should become, I mean, Making it a private company like makes sense to me, and maybe that's what Packer was aiming for, was gunning for, just to for Rhea to bloody take it all over. They're a few percent away. Because I mean, eighty-six like, percent. They, once they get to yeah, 90. it. it I, I think they've done their best to, you know, like ensure other people wear the wear the load of it as well. The other minority shareholders, but it, why it's is not, it public? Oh, well, I think it goes back to the history of it being a producing mine back in the day, which yeah. made sense for it to be public then. Here we are. Yeah. Yeah, fascinating. Love your work, boys. Love it. Right on. Get on that director's special, everyone. Moneyofmine.com. Thanks to all the partners, the new ones for today. Jimmy and the boys at WA Waterbores, mate. And there is a over a century of drilling experience in amongst his senior crew. They can fucking drill. Mate, uh, and who are, mate, Silverstone, Kenny Keo. While he's not being a good soccer player, JD, he can put power anywhere. Anywhere. Anywhere, mate. All our other friends, Verify, Get Wet Solutions, DSI Underground, Anytime Exploration, Brooks Airways, and K-Drill. Hodoro. Hodoro. The information contained in this episode of Money of Mine is of general nature only and does not take into account the objectives, financial situation or needs of any particular person. Before making any investment decision, you should consult with your financial advisor and consider how appropriate the advice is to your objectives, financial situation and needs.